Schizophrenia terrifies. It is the archetypal disorder of lunacy. Craziness scares us because we are creatures who long for structure and sense. We divide the interminable days into years, months, and weeks. We hope for ways to corral and control bad fortune, illness, unhappiness, discomfort, and death all inevitable outcomes that we pretend are anything but. And still the fight against entropy seems wildly futile in the face of schizophrenia, which shirks reality in favor of its own internal logic. People speak of schizophrenics as though they were dead without being dead, gone in the eyes of those around them. Schizophrenics are victims of the Russian word gibel, which is synonymous with doom and catastrophe, not necessarily death nor suicide, but a ruinous cessation of existence. We deteriorate in a way that is painful for others. Psychoanalyst Christopher Ballas defines schizophrenic presence as the psychodynamic experience of being with a schizophrenic who has seemingly crossed over from the human world to the non-human environment because other human catastrophes can bear the weight of human narrative, war, kidnapping, death, but schizophrenia's built-in chaos resists sense. Both Ibel and schizophrenic presence address the suffering of those or adjacent to the one who is suffering in the first place. Because the schizophrenic does suffer, I've been psychically lost in a pitch dark room. There is the ground which may be nowhere other than immediately below my own numbed feet. Those foot shaped anchors are the only trustworthy landmarks. If I make a wrong move, I'll have to face the gruesome consequence. In this bleak abyss, the key is to not be afraid because fear, though inevitable, only compounds the awful feeling of being lost. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, schizophrenia afflicts 1.1% of the American adult population. The number grows when considering the full psychotic spectrum, also known as the schizophrenias. 0.3% of the American population are diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. 3.9% are diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder. I am aware of the implications of the word afflicts which supports a neurotypical bias, but I also believe in the suffering of people diagnosed with the schizophrenias and our tormenting minds. Excuse me. Um, and then the, um, the next part that I'm going to read, can you hear me okay? The next part that I'm going to read is from is from an essay called Yale Will Not Save You. I'm still trying to figure out what okay is, particularly whether there exists a normal version of myself beneath the disorder in the way a person with cancer is a healthy person first and foremost. In the language of cancer, people describe a thing that invades them so that they can then battle the cancer. No one ever says that a person is cancer or that they have become cancer, but they do say that a person is manic depressive or schizophrenic once those illnesses have taken hold. In my peer education courses, I was taught to say that I am a person with schizoaffective disorder. Person first language suggests that there is a person in there somewhere without the delusions and the rambling and the catatonia. But what if there isn't? What happens if I see my disordered mind as a fundamental part of who I am? It has in fact shaped the way I experience life. 
Should the question be a matter of percentages of my lifetime, I've spent enough of this lifetime with schizoaffective disorder to see it as a dominant force. And if it's true that I think, therefore I am, perhaps the fact that my thoughts have been so heavily modeled with confusion means that those confused thoughts make up the gestalt of myself. This is why I use the word schizophrenic, although many mental health advocates don't. My friends with anxiety disorders, for example, tend to speak of anxiety as a component of their personalities. Laura Turner writes in her essay, How Do You Inherit Anxiety? It is from Verna Lee Boatwright Berg that I inherited my long face, my quick hands, my fear that someday soon I will do something wrong and the world will come to a sharp end. In their minds, there is no tabula rasa overlaid by a transparency of hypochondria generalized anxiety disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. Such thoughts are hardwired into their minds with no self that can be untangled from the pathology they experience. Another friend's obsessive compulsive disorder has calmed significantly since she began taking Prozac, but she continues to be most comfortable when things are tidy, even though her tidiness is no longer disruptive. She still washes her hands more thoroughly than anyone I know. COVID has not really helped that, by the way. There might be something comforting about the notion that there is deep down an impeccable self without disorder, and that if I try hard enough, I can reach that unblemished self. But there may be no impeccable self to reach, and if I continue to struggle toward one, I might go mad in the pursuit. And just one last bit. This one is from um, an essay called On the Ward, which is about inpatient hospitalization. During my second hospitalization, which occurred in the same location as my first, I passed a nurse. How are you doing? She asked. Okay, I said, which was true. My mania and subsequent depression seemed to have been exercised by the overdose I'd taken immediately prior to being hospitalized. And other than being frustrated by my return to the WS2 ward, Life no longer felt like an intolerable sentence. The nurse smiled. But how are you really doing? I'm really doing okay. The notes I've acquired from Yale Psychiatric Institute read, among other things, patient shows lack of insight. I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you. That was really lovely hearing something come from the author's own voice, I think. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll get started. So I have a lot of questions. I don't know that we'll get through all of mine. That would be understandable. <laughs> um, but we'll definitely <laughs> open it up to everybody. If you all have any questions while this is taking place, of course, feel free to put them in the chat, put them in that Q&A box, um, and we'll try to keep track of everything. Um, so, I mean, first thing, how, how are you doing? Um, how has your experience been during this pandemic? Um, you know, uh, I feel like my anxiety has gotten a lot worse. Um, gotten a lot of interesting physical symptoms. Um, I think in terms of, uh, in terms of how I'm doing in the, in the general sense, I know I'm a lot luckier than a lot of other people, but I think the interesting thing is, um, I speak to a lot of Whenever I speak to my friends and we all ask one another how we're doing, I feel like 
all of my friends feel like they have to suffix at, like how they're doing with like, but I know I'm so lucky and there are people out there who are doing so much worse than I am. You know, even if they are, you know, barely hanging on or if they have, you know, loved ones who are sick, you know, I've had friends who are taking care of small children who have COVID who still feel like they have to say, but I'm still doing so much better than so many other people out there. I think that there um, is this sense that we uh, almost have to apologize for the fact that we're not doing well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, to be completely honest, uh, it's tough, but I, yeah, it's tough for everybody, I think. Yeah, and I, I think I've, I've heard that a lot. I've done it. I, you know, it's hard when you see all the different ranges and levels of issues um, that are being highlighted because of the pandemic, that it, it, but, you know, a lot of us probably are having a hard time, and I mention often that it, there's a good chance there are people who've never actually reckoned with their own mental health, and I wonder what that uh, experience is right now for them, if they're still not, you know, actually considering it as an issue or, you know, what that situation is like. Um, mm -hmm. Have you found anything particularly helpful to you? Any like good like coping mechanisms or anything? Um, I think it's interesting how many coping mechanisms, because I've been dealing with my own mental health issues for so long, I have had kind of my, my toolkit of things that I use to deal with them. And it's interesting how many of those things have been taken away because of quarantine. Um, you know, like taking a walk or, I mean, it, it's, it's challenging because there's nothing technically keeping me from taking a walk, but I also have other health issues that make me nervous about taking a walk. So... I've actually only taken two walks in the 11 weeks that I've been quarantined. <laughs> and so, um, you know, or like seeing my friends, I, I, I tend to depend on spending time with my friends or like making dinner dates with my friends and, and things like that um, as, as something that tends to help me as well. Um, in terms of things that have helped me in the past that still help me, um, I, uh, I spend time on Pinterest, I play with my dog, I, um, I write, um, unfortunately, um, I have a book due at the end of the year. <laughs> and I'm st <laughs> and I'm able to write, which is which is good, and that helps. Um, I have actually started doing jigsaw puzzles, which I think is a, is something that um, people have picked up during the pandemic, um, and that actually h helps me. Um, but yeah, um, it's been interesting these things that I've kind of picked up here and there. I write a lot more paper letters than I used to. Um, I, I, almost every morning now, I write like three or four paper letters. Um, and and so, are these letters you are actually sending out or are they almost like letters? Yeah. Like letters. No, yeah, I, I, I mail them out. And, and that helps because, um, I mean, the USPS is struggling too, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to do my part there. <laughs> lots, of, lots of quarantine shopping. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I do want to ask you about your writing um, because mm -hmm. it's amazing. <laughs> uh, so mm -hmm. I wanted to say, like, I really enjoyed the writing in this book. Um, it's it's beautiful and it's humorous. Um, it's really deeply insightful and it puts us into different stories and experiences and you kind of take us on your journey. Um, so I was curious what led you to publish the book of essays. Um, that's one thing. And then is if there was kind of a way in which you've kind of developed this writing style as well. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I never thought that I would write nonfiction. It's funny too, because when I was on tour with this book, I said at about 95% of my, my events that I was never going to write a nonfiction book again. <laughs> um, and then I signed, I signed a book deal at the end of last year. It's not sure I'm writing another nonfiction book. Um, but yeah, um, it really happens because I had a tough time selling my first book. Um, my first book was a novel mm -hmm. and it took a long time to sell. And while I was waiting for something to happen with that novel, I mean, it ended up doing well critically and good things happened to my career because of it, but it had a hard time finding a publisher. And so while I was trying to find a publisher for it, I felt like I couldn't work on another novel until something happens with it. Like it felt like I was kind of cheating on it or something. Right. Um, so I decided I would try to write essays and because I was, um, I, I was going through, I had never written really written nonfiction before, except this one class I took in graduate school, a nonfiction class. I, it didn't, I didn't do that great in the class. I didn't write any like particularly good essays, nothing publishable, mm -hmm. but I happened to go through um, the events that make up the essay, Perdition Days, mm -hmm. um, that, that is um, in the collected schizophrenias. And so I wrote this essay and um, I tried to find a place for it and I had a hard time finding a place for it. And then my partner suggested, well, why don't you try the toast? And the toast was this website, rest in peace toast. It doesn't exist anymore, but um, it, it was uh, a website that Daniel Lavery and um, Nicole Cliff um, had put together. Um, and so I submitted it and Nicole Cliff took it right away. She didn't change a single thing and she put it up and it ended up um, getting a lot of attention. I mean, I think part of it was that Qatar's solution is really rare and there isn't that much written about it. So like I was getting attention from like the MIT journalism site and like, um, NBC Universal tried to option it. It was there, it just got a lot of attention. Um, and then after that, I was kind of like, well, maybe I'll try to write more essays about mental illness. And and it was kind of on on that path or on that journey that I taught myself how to be more of a journalist and how to do reporting and how to write. Sorry that my husband keeps going <laughs> back and forth. I'm at the dining room table because of <laughs> the, the internet is the best right here. So um, anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, I was teaching myself these things. Um, because I didn't want to just write these kind of memoiristic pieces. I was also interested in writing about things like, well, you know, what, what about like the laws that affect, mm -hmm. you know, treat involuntary treatment or like, what about like the way that, um, what about like the, the history of the way people have seen schizophrenia. And so, I ended up with a bunch of essays um, and my Asian at the time was not interested in, um, in these essays, but uh, long story short, I'm not going to go into that, but long story short, I submitted them myself to the Grey Wolf Nonfiction Prize and I won. And so I ended up, um, yeah, and that's how, that's how the book happened. The book would never have happened if I hadn't won the prize, though, because my agent wasn't interested in the essays. So I mm -hmm. submitted it to that contest 
thinking, well, if I don't win, nothing will happen with these essays and I'll just keep writing fiction, so. Wow, that's kind of amazing because, I mean, they're, they're really, like, I don't know, they're, they're very something. I don't, <laughs> like, <laughs> they're gripping in a lot of ways. They are researched, you know, and then they, you know, it provides all this context, but it's also very personal, and, um, and it really is the way you write also. I think that really helps with, you know, reading what can be very difficult topics and reading about it, but really actually kind of, you know, some of our participants in the discussions of this, they were surprised they started like speeding through the book, right? Like, <laughs> um, like I really nice. the book discussion. And so I read like the second half of it in like a few hours and, you know, and mm -hmm. when I was preparing for that part. And so it really is one that, um, I think it's just so like wonderful and I mean did you show it to other people before your agent or before the gray wolf um like did, did um, other some of the essays had been published in other places so like some of them you'll see you can see it in the front of the back book it'll say like such and such essay was published in catapult mm -hmm. such and such essay was published yeah yeah in the believer etc um, and can I ask what, I guess, the writing process for you is like, and that, like, difference between the nonfiction and fiction? I know you just held, like, one workshop kind of talking about um, one method, um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear, especially the differences um, in how that goes. Yeah, so um, I... Yeah, you're right. I just taught a workshop about this and I taught it at this table. So I actually still have my stuff at this table. Um, it was funny. I had lunch with, um, you know, poet and nonfiction writer um, Hanif Adurki, um last year. And uh, we were, it's so interesting to have, um, well, First of all, like we got to know each other because our books were on the bestseller list at around the same time, which was really shocking to both of us because our books were both not your typical like New York Times bestseller books. Like they were both from like small presses. Mm -hmm. And so we got together and we were talking and I... It, it's so funny to get to know writers because you, you, one of the things you often learn is just like how incredibly different your process is from like other people. So he was telling me about how like when he sits down to write, like he doesn't know what a thing will be like until like he starts writing it, which just blew me away. He was like, I don't know if it'll be a poem or like a nonfiction piece or like whatever. And that just blew my mind because like, for me, if something is going to be a nonfiction piece, I have such a different process mm -hmm. for writing a nonfiction um, than writing, say, fiction, that it has to be, I have to know what it's going to be before, mm -hmm. when I sit down. Right. So because we are at this dining room table, I can show you all. Yay. <laughs> this is the... Um, box that holds all the index cards that make up the collected schizophrenia. Wow. Um, and so, uh, so this is what I was teaching in my um, workshop was how to use this index card method. So you can see um, like this little folder says high functioning. Oh. And then if you like take out the index cards, you can see like the index cards that make up that essay. Oh, wow. So it's like, so it's like, um, so it's like, got, this is a quote from this index card, for example, that says, recent statistics indicate that only one in five people with schizophrenia can ever be expected to live independently and hold a job. This is from The Center Cannot Hold by Ellen Sachs, page 288. So yeah, so I have this method um, of writing nonfiction 
Um, and so I ended up building out these index cards and, um, and they are kept in this box. And I, because I have another nonfiction book that I, it's not due at the end of this year. It's pro I probably have like two or three more years. Um, <laughs> so got a little while. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, but I did take out like a new box and I put it on my desk. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's exciting because it's, it's empty right now, but it, it's kind of like, I get to, it's making space for, for, uh, for the new book. Um, so is it also kind of how you collect your research too? Like you note down which research you think you're going use or yeah it's like it's research but it's also like anecdotes or like words that I think are interesting or um as I'm writing like questions that I have or like want to ask myself um and then as the process goes on um when I'm figuring out like structure and stuff like that then I um then I have like questions like interview with I don't know, <laughs> interview with abortionist question mark. And then I'll, and then that's how I decide like, oh, like I need to have an interview. I need to have an interview with an abortionist here. Okay. Um, and then I'll go and do that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a process that I cobbled together from like four different index card processes that I learned about. Yeah. Cool. I, I like it because it's very yeah, and then fiction is very different. Yeah. So with fiction, is it a little more seeing what happens as you write or is there still some storyboarding? Oh my gosh. Fiction <laughs> is okay. See fiction, see fiction to me. Okay. Nonfiction to me is kind of like math or science and, mm -hmm. um, and fiction is like, it's more like um just like wandering in a forest like you're like I have no idea where I'm going and like I might throw away 200 pages oh, because it turns out to be <laughs> like you know it, you know it turns out to be garbage but you know it's, it's so much different yeah it's, right. it's very different and th so that's the process I'm going through right now yeah, because your next one is fiction, correct? Your next project is fiction? Yeah, so right now I'm working on a novel and I'm, um, I'm sending like every 10,000 words to my, <laughs> to my agent. And, um, <laughs> but it's fun. I love it. It's so great. I mean, they're just, they're, they're, they're just really different. Like the, the processes are very different. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, all right. And I'll try to slowly. Yeah, no, I love answering questions about like, process. Like, process. that's how I never get fun. there. Um, <laughs> but um, so, you know, this kind of relates to both the way you write, but also um, like I, I felt like throughout the book, you really highlighted the importance of like language and phrases and words. Um, like how things are described by doctors, for doctors and media. Um, could you speak on this precision of language and how you think um, we could be better in this way? Yeah, I mean, I, I care about the words that we use because I, I think that, um, because I, I try to be very careful in the words that I use in my writing, um, both in fiction and nonfiction. So, um, I also feel like um, in terms of stigma or prejudice um, in particular, there are all kinds of ways that the language that we use wends its way into our subconscious. And if we're not careful, it'll really kind of carve its way into our neural pathways and create um, create, you know, an image of the kind of person that we think mm -hmm. a certain group of people are, or, um, 
you know, whether like a physical image or like the character of a type of people or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and sorry, I just saw a comment in the chat and I should have brought it up earlier. <laughs> so I'll go back real quick. Um, so somebody pointed out that influence of prizes is something we could probably spend years on, but it is funny because Ms. Wang, you've been lauded as a real force of contemporary fiction, one of our canon voices. I thought that was really nice. That was Maria. That's, that's incredibly nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's so great to think of um, canon in ways other than your usual old white male writers. <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. that's something. So I think that's such a lovely sentiment. Um, and then let me see here. So throughout the book, you bring up journeys through diagnosis or treatment. Um, and at the end of the book, you note that your diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, and late stage Lyme disease. I think I have that correct. Um, so I, I was kind of wondering if you could share if that is still the diagnosis that you have or have gone with, you know. Um, and I think, you know, just in talking about diagnosis and all these things, um, you know, a lot of discussion was coming up about like the biomedical model versus the recovery model and things like that. So, um, yeah, on around that subject. Um, um, I think that in terms of uh, my mental health diagnoses, um, they're, you know, really in terms of my, um, mental health diagnoses as well as my, uh, I don't know, physical uh, or chronic, physical chronic illness diagnoses. Um, I'm, I try to be pretty clear in the book that there is a lot of fluidity to these diagnoses and that um, both with, uh, you know, the schizophrenias as well as you know, um, with the diagnosis of chronic Lyme or late stage Lyme, there's a certain amount of skepticism that I have about all of it because, in terms of with um, the schizophrenia, is you know, so you know, the, the DSM is a, a changing book, um, and in terms of uh, those diagnoses, they're there are these boxes that people make um, to help us with treatments. Um, but my, um, the medications that I took didn't really change so much between when my diagnosis was bipolar disorder and when it changed to schizoaffective disorder. So um, I do still primarily identify as having schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type. Um, PTSD is still um, chronic, the, yeah, CPTSD is still a diagnosis that I identify with. Um, some kind of anxiety issue, um, generalized anxiety disorder. The thing about um, late stage Lyme, I think I already was fairly skeptical by the time the book was published, um, in part because of my history and background in the sciences and in labs and how I felt like the way the CDC talked about chronic Lyme was very confusing. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, I just kind of talk about having some kind of chronic illness. I, I, I don't really know um, what it is. I'm not quite as comfortable um, using the Lyme mm -hmm. label as I used to be. Um, yeah, I mean, if I can, but again, like I, I still take basically the same medications that I took before I, before I decided to not use that word as much. Mm -hmm. So um, 
how you how useful or less useful those names are mm -hmm. is is continues to be an interesting conversation to me yeah um i mean you have a whole chapter called diagnosis um and it, it seems you know you you read a bit about kind of partly how it can help you know there's a thing that you're um working on working with working you know like to be able to identify that but then also whether it's putting you in a corner or something um and that seems to be yeah and I see in the mental health community quite a bit and another thing that um that it can do which can be helpful or less helpful is to help associate you with other people with a similar diagnosis. So in the case of the schizophrenia, I have really found it extremely lovely to meet all kinds of people with the publication of this book. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I have felt more like moving away from the chronic Lyme community. Mm -hmm. So which is not to really say anything about the community itself, but more to say that's just my personal relationship with it at the moment. Mm -hmm. And people, just as people's relationships to, you know, people are always changing. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I was like, is this, it, it was something I was kind of wondering, just, you know, just given the kind of conversation that you were having really throughout the book. Um, and so th there is one question from an attendee that they submitted in advance. It's a bit longer, so I might also tap, type it to you in the chat <laughs> or, mm -hmm. in, or in the Q&A. Um, so I'll read it. It says, um, I'd be interested in hearing Esme's perspective on the integration of harm redu reduction and transformative justice practices around schizophrenia, especially in relation to involuntary hospitalizations. Um, and then she quotes you, uh, where you write, involuntary commitment may sometimes be warranted, but it has never felt useful for me. Um, so she's asking what then would be useful? How do we make sure we are serving those in crisis the way that they need? How do we center the safety and well-being of the patient in these moments of crisis rather than the safety well-being of those around them. Yeah. Oh, this is a really, really, it's a really, really tough question. Um, and I, I am, I'm um, really, it's a really tough question. I think it's a really important question. Mm -hmm. However, um, it's also a question that I kind of avoided <laughs> in writing the book. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say a little bit about my my purpose in writing the book, or like how I felt in writing the book, which was that um, I really worried when I was writing this book that what would happen to me is that I would become like the schizophrenia person, mm -hmm. and that like any time schizophrenia came up in the news that like NPR would call me and then I would like have to become the talking head to discuss it or like not even schizophrenia necessarily, like anything having to do with mental health. So like, you know, like a law would come up having to do with involuntary hospitalization and then I would have to like pop up and like appear on like the CBC or like, you know, I don't know, the Today Show or, you know, um, MSNBC and like talk about how I felt about these issues, not because I don't care about them, but because I am the kind of person who has a really hard time. Like I'm the, I'm the kind of person who like is constantly arguing with themselves. Mm -hmm. it, um, I think that which is not to say that I don't have strong opinions about things, but I think that when it comes to things like this, like when it comes to involuntary hospitalization or 
when it comes to, you know, what should, yeah, harm reduction, like what should we do about like involuntary treatment? Like I find it very hard to, to say this is what it should be mm-hmm. like, or this is what I think it should be. The law mm-hmm. should say this, like I can help you make the law. And because I, because this is my opinion and my opinion is good. Um, and, um, and so that's why I always said that with this book, I never wanted the book to feel like it was giving the reader answers to questions, but more to say, here's a lot of information that I have, including my own experiences and some things that I've researched and some conversations that I've had. And maybe you can think about what you've, you decide Mm -hmm. what you think your opinion is. I know it sounds like a (laughs) pop out, but, but that genuinely is how I wanted the book to read. And, and and I think that that is why I am never called upon by these places (laughs) to be a talking head. Um, Yeah. Just because I, I'm not an authority in the, in this way. Well, I think, I mean, a lot of your writing, it it is personal, and I think that does come across, too, is that a lot of people might have experiences that give them one viewpoint over the other. Um, So for a lot of people, it is their own personal feelings, um, um, what they hope for, what to be expected. Um, So, yeah. No, thank you. I <laughs> I wanted to bring it up because I was like, oh yes, this is a very deep question. <laughs> <I wanna get laughs> it is a very deep question, yeah. Um, and so one thing I was wondering is the book really includes quite a lot of medical and scholarly information as well as socio-cultural. Um, so are there certain resources or even like popular representations you think are great to look at on the subjects of mental health, and I would say also disability justice, since you do talk about um, a bit of disability justice as well. Um, I've worked with um, the Mental Health Association of San Francisco a lot, and I think that they do a lot of great stuff, Um, and they're local, so so I recommend them. Um, In terms of books, I I am kind of something that actually um, just came up today is uh, do you know the Ellie's was today? The one um, is the, it's it's that it's like a jur- it's the it's like a journalist um, award like a journalistic of prizes anyway um, <laughs> I was really excited to see that S E Smith um, like S dot E dot um one for um i believe columnist um for catapult Mm -hmm. and they wrote they write uh, for their columns about mental illness and disability for catapult and so those are some great columns i was actually just reading some of those before i hopped on this (laughs) this event um, actually, here, let me type it into the chat for you, and then you can share it. All right. I want to make sure we get to everybody's questions, so I will, uh, let me get some of the audience questions, and then um, I'll have more if there's time. <laughs> um, so one um, is when writing about your own mental illness in the essays, how do you or can you avoid reliving trauma? And what strategies would you suggest for other people trying to write about oh, It's tough. I mean, there were, there are certain things, there were certain essays in the book that were really hard to write. I went through literally thousands of pages of journals um, to work, write this book. Um, and sometimes I would actually get physically sick um, 
when I was writing the book. Um, the, the essay, John Doe Psychosis, was also really tough to write. Um, I would just say, um, if you're writing about something traumatic, to try and take care of yourself as much as possible, take lots of breaks, drink lots of water. Um, if you can, um, if you can work with a therapist, um, try to find a therapist. If you don't have one, um, try to find one sliding scale if you can't afford one. Um, that, cause that, that was really, um, important for me when I was, um, writing this. Um, I think also, um, There are certain things that I would recommend, and this is just my opinion, of course, not writing about at a given time. Like sometimes you need more space from a thing. Like there have been times when I thought I was ready to write about something, but I really wasn't. Um, and I would try to write about it over and over and over again. Um, and the truth of it was, I just wasn't ready. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have that distance. I didn't have, um, I was too lost in it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then Michael had asked um, if you learned your writing processes through a class or you kind of just discovered it naturally with what works for you? Um, I, with the index card thing, I just made, I cobbled it together through a bunch of things that I found on the internet. Um, <laughs> and now I teach it to people <laughs> in a class. <laughs> um, and uh, with the fiction, yeah, that was also just figuring out what worked best for me. I think most of the time, if if you want to be a writer and you do end up taking a lot of classes, there will usually only be a very small percentage of each class that will actually be useful for you. And then in the end, you'll just have like a bunch of stuff um, and you'll figure out what, what works for you. But it'll take time. I mean, that's the thing. Like I, I always um, talk about when people you know, describe like a writer as being an overnight success. Like usually that writer has been working in the dark for like 20 years before, <laughs> before their first book was published or, you know, before anyone noticed them. Yeah. My first book was rejected 41 times before wow. it got published. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is, is it hard to keep trying when that happens of course yes <laughs> like you know what happened with my Me first too. book I, you know what happened with my first book it got rejected 41 times and I was like I actually took the the book the manuscript and I emailed it to like 10 of my friends with this really sad email that was like my book has been rejected so many times it's been like five years I think it's never going to get published and I just want somebody to read it so that it's not just going to like die in a drawer. Aww. So here you go. And I hope you read it. But then like I ended up being chosen as like one of the best young American novelists, <laughs> like by Granta. And it, it's, you know, it was, yeah. Like, it's just like, well, who's yeah. reading, you know, that's always kind of a question with publishing too. I know. Who's the gatekeeper. Yeah. And which ones exactly. get the uh, marketing behind it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, all right. So then my uh, mentions, um, and again, this is longer. It's in the Q&A box. Um, one of many Should I look at the Q&A 
box you with that. I'll read it, but <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, so one of many aspects I found refreshing in your book is your view on motherhood. The struggle between your desire to have um, children and wanting to be fully present for their upbringing, um, but also accepting the reality that the illness may intrude on that role. Often society defines and shapes women's identity by their marital status and the number of children they have. How do you navigate around the societal pressure and stigma towards mental health so that it doesn't influence you and your husband's decision making process? Um, I uh, would have to say that I would be foolish to say that societal pressure and stigma don't influence it in some way because I, I live in this culture and the culture will influence me in some way, whether I like it to or not. Um, as much as I would like to think it doesn't, um, it's in some con uh, subconscious and unconscious way it does. Um, I, uh, let's see, what are the other questions? Um, the other parts of the question. Um, I think I, I uh, the fact that I'm not going to have children is something that I still think about. Um, it's still something I'm working through, um, and I might for the rest of my life. Um, I have really great nieces, um, but yeah. Uh, I, uh, I'm pretty happy with the life that I have. Thank you. These are such meaty questions. Um, okay. All right. So I, um, I had one question. Um, I was wondering, you know, and obviously I know nobody's a monolithic, um, experience, but, um, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit on your experience. Uh, on your experience in context of your cultural background. Um, so I believe you've mentioned, um, I think we spoke previously, you mentioned your parents are from Taiwan, um, mine are as well. Mm -hmm. um, and your mom does appear in your book in conversations that you've had with her about mental health and illness. Um, and then you also mentioned speaking at Chinatown clinics. So, so I was kind of curious on your thoughts, um, whether you've kind of seen a difference, a different type of stigma or treatment of mental health um, with those communities, um, or if there's, you know, a way to further the discussion, um, especially like in AAPI communities. Yeah, I mean, there's an enormous amount of stigma about mental health issues. Um, when I um, with, when I gave um, talks at the Chinatown Mental Health Clinic, I would be amazed when I saw. Um, immigrants there like I I I was like wow like how did you get here um, um, yeah I mean cultural stigma is very real in all kinds of immigrant communities not just AAPI communities mm -hmm. um, and but I think there are so many things that they have in common it's this um, this idea that it, it's like saving face to not discuss right. that these things. It's um, it's shameful to let other families know that your family is dealing with this. Um, I do think that I do think that a lot of positive change can happen in the younger generations. Um, but yeah, it does, um, it does depend on the conversations that, that people are willing to have. And it, it depends a lot on how um, open the older generations are willing to be. Um, I think one really important thing is when someone from 
an older generation, say my mom, um, who wasn't always um, open about these things, um, as I described in my book. Um, she now talks to her sisters and brothers about it. And she talks to her friends who have kids about it. Um, and I think that's important, um, because she is going to be a better gateway mm -hmm. than somebody from a younger generation. And, and I think that's great. Yeah. And, and do you think that, did that change come from you, from your conversations and from that? Yeah, that change. I, I get asked this all the time because, um, because as I describe in the book, she was not open to these things at all when I was first diagnosed with depression in high school. Um, and now she's very, um, very understanding. Um, and people are always like, how did that happen? Like, how did you make that happen? And it, I don't unfortunately have like a, well, you do this and this and this. Um, it happened over time and part of it happens because we had to live together after I was um, almost kicked out of college for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and she saw firsthand how sick I was. And she sorted through all my pills in the morning and, um, and at night. And, uh, but it took time. It took a lot of time. And she, you know, and it wasn't, um, it, w it had to do with like her motivation too. Um, she found books to read and, um, and she learned, she learned on her own too, so. Cool, that's great. I mean, I think when you're like, you know, I get asked this a lot. I was like, yeah, a lot of people are probably <laughs> in a similar situation, you know, like myself included, where I'm, you know, it's, it's something harder to talk about or it's not going to shut down, you know? And um, so I'm sure there are many kind of out there with that experience of just not being able to talk about it with, you know, people who, your, your, your caregivers, really, you know, your, your people who've raised you and all that, so. <laughs> my mom um, is desperate to have my book translated into Chinese so that she can, like, share uh, it <laughs> in Taiwan. I mean, and I, I mean, I'm sure Taiwan, I imagine, is an easier place to publish than China, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that would I can't control these foreign rights things. So yeah, you know. you're like I'm not dealing with. <laughs> um, and then, do you have any advice for someone who might be experiencing mental health challenges but can't pinpoint what might be happening? Especially, I guess, right now too, which you know, different types of challenges, but. Um, well, I would say to try and not figure it out on your own. This is not your job. There are people whose job it is to figure this stuff out. Um, it can be really scary to seek out help, but, um, but it is it can be life-saving and it can be really important. And if you don't like the first person you see, don't settle for that person. Find somebody else that you like better. Mm -hmm. um, your life can be better. Um. I wrote such um, serious questions. <laughs> uh, I, I'm kind of curious, um, 
So I actually first heard you speak on Call Your Girlfriend, the podcast, um, and you were speaking on disability justice. And so I actually did kind of want to ask you what you'd like to see improve when it comes to disability justice. Oh, God. Uh, everything? Um, yeah. I'm asking these questions where it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that, um, okay, I'll just pick like a thing. I'll, I'll just pick like one thing. <laughs> I think, um, and I can, I can be better about this too, but even just like, um, internet accessibility, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, it would be great if this had captions. Yep. Um, this Zoom event had captions, um, and if people are on Twitter um, and you want to share a photo, um, take that extra time to like type in the alt text for your image. Mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Um, sometimes it doesn't take that long. It's just like one extra thing. Um, and, uh, but it can make a really big difference for somebody. Yes. And I will say we did captions during our event. We had Virgie Tovar and Alex Locust, um, who's a disability activist speak and we did captions. Um, and so, so it was, uh, Jenny, Jenny and I <laughs> typing them and it was hard. <laughs> we, we were definitely missing things and <laughs> we did not have the capacity yeah. to um, and it, you know, they really kind of rake you over with, you know, when you try to purchase something. So they have to monetize that is so frustrating that if you try to purchase a third party caption service, that they will really, you know, charge you for that. Um, but yeah, I, I know that's something that, you know, we are looking at, especially if we are in this environment where we're having a lot of virtual events. Um, yeah, and, like with my workshop that I did last week, um, I didn't have captions and then I ended up paying like $120 to have the entire thing transcribed and then to get my assistant to um, get the time tags for every single question <laughs> um, in the entire event and then to like write the question next to each time tag and then to like get the entire, yeah, it was a, a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, the good thing is, I think YouTube, once you upload it, you can do automatic captions. And same thing, Facebook Live, I turned on automatic captions for today. We'll see how well it goes. And if it writes really funny things, um, we shall see. <laughs> how it goes. Um, but yeah, we were almost shocked. We're like, oh, we thought we were pretty fast typers. We clearly were not fast enough. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So one last question that's a little more fun and then I do want to check if anybody like wants to come on the mic um so uh are there writers that you're really enjoying right now um and are there any like favorite recent or new books we should be looking out for oh gosh um so I normally am um really on the cutting edge of the uh, the up and coming books. Um, but since the quarantine, I've had a really hard time reading anything new. So I've just been rereading old things. Um, like I reread Anna Kernan. <laughs> um, let's see, is there, did I manage to read anything new? <laughs> Or even old things that are, yeah, like it, it was Anna Karenina. Is that comforting for you? <laughs> is it a comfort? Oh, I love, An I love Anna Karenina. It's one of my favorite books. Yeah. I love Anna Karenina. It's so good. Um, uh, okay, I'm looking at the bookshelf in front of me <laughs> right now. Um, you Can Have a Body Like Mine by Alexandra Kleeman is great. Um, see what else um under the udala trees by chinello opranta um 
yeah, those are those are a couple of really good books. I have some great books that I that are on my to be read pile right now that I'm supposed to be blurbing, oh. um, but I um, I'm, I'm still gonna hold off on <laughs> recommending those. Yes, no worries. Um, yes, I've been disappointed in myself because it's like, oh, you have more time, and then, oh well, no, you're tired. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's just like, it's not so much that I'm tired, it's that my, like, brain is not working. Like, yeah, right yeah. I, uh, I, I keep buying books. I'm like, let's support independent bookstores. And so yes, those I've been buying so many books, yeah. <laughs> they keep coming, and then um, I don't do anything with them, not right now, anyway. Yeah. Life has pretty much been Animal Crossing. I, I talk about it too much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then, I mean, can you share anything about the project that you're working on right now, the fiction, or is it kind of Yeah, um, no, I mean, there was an announcement about it last oh. year, so um, it's called uh, Soft Animals, and it's about a chronically ill woman who uh, inherits a, a haunted lodge in a small, in the small town where she grew up, um, from the parents of a peer of hers who died in hate crime when they were in high school. Mm. And, um, there's, uh, there's queerness, there's, um, emotional violence, there's, um, yeah, like I said, ghosts, um yeah that's that's some of it oh and <laughs> yeah and uh yeah that's that's all i'll say for now yeah there's definitely a bit of an intensity i think in some of your fiction <laughs> story i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> 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 so funny. do you find that you kind of drift your drift towards i guess the more i don't know like I think for my fiction, um, I tend to write more gothic fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I remember reading you know, Carmen Maria Machado's review of uh, Border of Paradise. Um, and I think she also described it as like a, as gothic, but in like a whole different type of way. Um, and I love the way mm -hmm. that she described it too. <laughs> Okay. The term um, so I do. I oh, <laughs> I was just gonna say the term that I invented for my fiction was immigrant gothic. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, are there if there are any attendees who really want to speak up, you know, on the mic, uh, raise your hand, and I can give you the permission to talk. Um, anybody? No. Okay. All right. Then I'm going to end it there. Do you have anything else that you want to let us know about where we can find you? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So um, my website is at esmewang.com. There's a lot of stuff on there, including free resources. Um, there's a thing that could be good for people now called encouragement notes. You can sign up for it and you get um, an encouraging note for in your email every day for I think two weeks. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Esme Wang and I'm on Instagram at Esme W. Wang. Cool. You always have very gorgeous photos. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know. It, sometime I kind of want to ask you about your like fashion background too, but maybe not. <laughs> and hopefully at some point um, I and others can actually see you in person and get our book signed. Um, and I want to do something really silly. And I know it's kind of silly because there's such a thing as a screen capture, <laughs> but I kind of want to take like a selfie with Zoom because that's something okay. we would normally do, but instead it's going to be through Zoom. Um, oh, how do you do now, that? Well, I'm just gonna use my phone and see how silly this looks. I've never tried this before, but I thought it would be kind of funny. 
um, because I always ask for a selfie. But anyway, <laughs> let me see. I don't know if this is going to work. Let me see. Is going to work, kind of? <laughs> okay, that's as close as we're going to get right now. Um, okay, and actually, Hermia, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, raised her hand, raised their hand, so I'm going to allow you to talk. Thank you. Oh, they have to unmute themselves. Oh. Uh, I really, really enjoy the, this um, talk on Zoom. <laughs> and then, yes, yeah, nice to see you and nice to explain the, uh, the book. Thank you. Really. I, I, because I discussed the email yesterday, unless I can invite my professor to attend this one, because I really, uh, I am a major in psychology and mm. I really like oh. biology but um, yes that's why I was feeling really very interested about this book. Awesome thank, thank you, you so for much. coming. Um, and we are recording this so um, if it, we do have the permission we will go ahead and post that um, and originally there was going to be like a little bit of a documentary filming during the session that's of course not happening because we are all in our own homes <laughs> um, <laughs> <someday. laughs> but all right awesome okay I think that is it again um, I want to ask everybody to please fill out the survey um, if Jenny could link it again and again you can find more information on our program um, on our website. There's also recordings of our previous sessions, um, and that includes one on mental health during COVID, um, a heart and soul peer um, discussion, and we actually just had a live art and journaling workshop, and then like I mentioned, Virgie Tovar and Alex Locust. And then we will have an event on June 10th, um, and that will be with NAMI San Mateo County, um, who has partnered with us, and that's gonna be a peer and family discussion. Um, with their outreach coordinator who um, also does um, have schizophrenia. So um, please join us for that. And again, thank you so much, Esme. I only wish so we could meet. I'm so grateful. <laughs> First, thank you. I will, yes, I'm like, yeah, so grateful um, and so glad we could make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Hi. Thanks, Jen. Stop recording.